I'm going to start actually, I was going to say a hundred years ago, all films um, were experimental. And when I first started out, I was an experimental filmmaker. I was actually a, a student. Um, I went to an all-night gig at the Screen of Ring in Islington, where the Sex Pistols, the Slits, the Clash, and the Buzzcocks played. And in between each of the bands, they played a part of Kenneth Anger's Magic Lantern Cycle, which, as a sort of 18-year-old, I think I was, 18, 17, I was completely kind of blown away by these things, which I thought, in a way, I guess it was a kind of overhang from the sort of employee kind of light show, psychedelia, music and image combination. But Kenneth Anger's vision as an experimental filmmaker, and these are films of I think the earliest was made in the late 40s, and they continued being made by him up until Scorpio Rising was probably 50s. Anyway, if you, you should see the films, and then you'll see how interesting they are. But there was this whole other world on the screen that was kind of, in a way, contrary to the, the um, youthful exuberance, shall I say, of the music. But it made me completely and utterly enamored of that kind of moving image, which was non-narrative, abstract, erotic, often highly erotic, um, but dynamic and powerful, and so I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I had the, the great fortune to meet um, the filmmaker Derek Jarman around the same time, who asked me to do sets and costumes for his film Jubilee, which was his kind of homage to the punk movement. And um, Derek gave me a Super 8 camera, and I started making my experimental films. And I had some, of, I mean, they were terrible, they meant a lot to me, and there was the magic of shooting something, getting something back. In those days, with a little cartridge of film, you sent to the chemist, and it came back. If if they'd allowed you to have it back, when you shot. Um, but it was a magical thing to get the first reel of film back, and then slowly I became more ambitious, based on longer films. And I had a few shows um, at the ICA. I think my first one was in 1981. And that continued through to about 1984-85. And along the way, one of the shows, um, which was called The Cultural Impotence of Stupid Boys, got, um, got a rave review, uh, bizarrely, in The Times. And I'd gone along to an exhibition at this place, which was called the Olympus Gallery, which Olympus Cameras had opened at that time. And this guy hadn't read the review in The Times. He obviously hadn't seen the show. Um, but he was kind of impressed that I'd had this very good review for this exhibition and said, would you like a video camera? And I was like, mm, okay. And I took the video camera and it had a portable pack for the videotape to go in there and the camera was about this big. Um, and I was extremely excited to have a piece of free technology. And of course, instead of shooting three and a half minutes of Super 8, I was able to shoot 60 minutes or 120 minutes of video. And what we started to do was to project the Super 8 films, we filmed them, used two projectors, and we got into a very elaborate, we thought, and very high-tech, we thought, approach to filmmaking. Anyway, to cut a long story, middle shorter, um, that led me into, by accident, I was very snobby for a long time about music videos, and I thought that that was the last place an experimental filmmaker should go. And then a group called Everything With The Girl in 1984 asked me to do a video for them, and I found out how much money you got paid. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And I did a couple of videos for them, and they were fairly successful. And then um, some other friends started to ask me to do videos for them, and one of those was a fantastic girl called Nana Cherry. And for her, I did a video for this, a song called Buffalo Stunts, which a lot of criticism was around at that time of art pop videos that they were just wallpaper. And so I decided I would use a book of wallpaper samples behind Nana as she was performing the song Buffalo Stunts. And I put them under a caption camera, I put them through rather crude sort of treatments. But I worked in a place called Soho 601, which was the first digital video edit suite in London. And what was extraordinary was through using chroma key backgrounds, which it becomes relevant there is a relevance to this. It becomes relevant in a bit because it's to do with film CGI work. But I was able to kind of layer up not just Nano, but the backing dancers, these wallpaper samples, and make a very psychedelic, lurid, quite grotesque, actually, but beautiful pop video. And it 
it sort of was a nice slap in the face of the critics, and it actually it was wallpaper. Um, and it was fun, and it did extremely well. And what I also realized from that experience was the difference between making experimental films and showing them sort of 30 clever clogs in the Cinematheque of the ICA was that with a pop video, suddenly I was reaching 300 million kids across Europe, or across the world, actually. And that sort of pinnacle in a, a much simpler video idea, which was for sharing a comic called Nothing Compares to You. And in that video, um, I actually just hewed all, got rid of all the kind of video technology, and I just filmed Sinead's face in close-up, with a few little cutaways, because I had to spend the budget. Um, <laughs> but what that video did, actually, was it highlighted a, how beautiful Sinead was, and how extraordinary her performance was. And we, we'd sort of talked about the emotional content of the video, but what I didn't know and what I couldn't predict was that the 13 takes, and I did continuous takes of the whole song each time, she cried in seven of these takes. And when we put the video out, people who watched the video cried at home. And it was sort of disastrous in a way because the record went to number one in 29 countries all over the world and made Sinead a millionaire and a superstar and kind of, excuse my language, but fucked her up because she wasn't expecting to have that kind of success. And that emotional engagement that people felt with her also kind of gave elements of the media, they thought, the opportunity to tear her apart emotionally. And that did happen. So that's a little side issue about the dangers of celebrity. Um, anyway, what the success of that film did was actually allow me to make more elaborate, complex digital films, and that eventually led me to my first feature, which I can actually stop talking and show you. The film. So actually, this is actually the trailer, and this was um, from 1998, 10 years ago now, um, Love is the Devil. Come to bed, and you can have whatever you want. Tonight on Hungry Eye, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Britain's greatest living painter, Francis Bacon. I do it with a chance, Brushko. You actually make money out of painting. Mm. You may well become a subject. I was holding a picture of me. Could we pause a smile, please? Welcome to the concentration camp. Jesus, I'm really sick of it. I'll talk to you after you have a shave. Yeah. I'm going to explode. Hang on. I'll be sure I'll do my lunch. Boxing is 